Hi everyone, uh, I'm Liam Eagle, I'm the editor here at The Were, and I'd like to welcome you all to another of our Were webinars. Uh, today's, te uh, today's session is titled, VPS is Dead, Long Live VPS, uh, and it's going to feature a presentation from Lowell Anderson, uh, who is Director of Product Marketing at Parallels. Uh, I'll let Lowell introduce himself uh, you know, more thoroughly in a moment uh, when I turn things over to him, but before I do, I just wanted to share a, a couple of housekeeping notes. First of all, uh, an archived video copy of the webinar is going to be up in the webinar archives on the WER site uh, early next week, and it'll include all the slides and audio from today's presentation, so if you want to revisit anything, you can certainly do so that way. Uh, if you want to get there quickly, it's theword.com slash webinars. Uh, secondly, we've got about an hour today, and we're going to save some time at the end uh, for a Q&A. Uh, we're going to save all the questions for the end. But you can feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation, and I'll keep, keep an eye on those and, and sort of be ready for when the Q&A session starts. Um, we will have a record of all the questions asked, so if you have, uh, ask a question and it doesn't get answered because you run out of time, uh, don't worry, someone will follow up with you after the fact. And, and finally, if you have a question you'd rather not ask in public, uh, so to speak, the contact information for Lola or for somebody else at Parallels will be uh, on screen later in the presentation, probably during the Q&A period, so you can seek them out directly and sort of touch base with them outside the webinar. Uh, right now, I'm going to turn things over to Lowell and let him introduce himself properly. Okay, thank you, Liam. Appreciate that. We'll wait until I can uh, begin sharing here, and then we'll get started. Okay, Liam, can you confirm that we are sharing? Looks good. Oh, I think the slide is just showing up now. There you go. Are we good? We're good, Liam. Thank Absolutely. you. All right. Well, welcome, everyone, for joining us today. I appreciate it. My name is Lowell Anderson, and I am the Director of Product Marketing for our Infrastructure as a Service products here at Parallels. Uh, Parallels is one of the leaders in providing uh, cloud enablement and virtualization solutions for hosted service providers. And uh, today we're going to talk about VPSs and the future of VPS. The title is uh, quite provocative, I realize, but there are some significant uh, technological and business case changes that are happening in the world of VPS today, which uh, are very interesting for us to understand. I'll start the discussion today by talking about the opportunities today, which for hosters uh, are really more significant today than they've ever been. Um, is VPS really dead? Well, we'll try to answer that question, as well as talk about what it takes to deliver a modern IIS solution into this new environment. As part of that IIS solution, I'll talk about cloud VPSs for small and medium-sized businesses, which are primarily the targets for most of our hosting service providers, as well as uh, other solutions and requirements for cloud hosting. And then we'll finish up with a Q&A, and I'll do my best to try to answer your questions. And if not, well, then we'll, uh, we'll follow up with additional answers later. So a brief overview of what's going on in the SMB IT ecosystem. We know historically that uh, prior to, to this movement to the cloud, the IT ecosystem was roughly a $1.1 trillion US market. Uh, that market was made up primarily of ISVs, distributors, hundreds of distributors, then delivering that, those solutions through millions of VARs. This traditional IT ecosystem uh, was less efficient for SMBs, uh, and that is being primarily changed by what's happening today in cloud. The movement to the cloud IT ecosystem is greatly uh, changing this IT system from the hundreds of distributors now being replaced by thousands, tens of thousands of service providers delivering that, that services through of ours and systems integrators directly to hosters as hosted services. And as part of that IT ecosystem, many of the applications that we used to have a resident on our machines and on-premise locations have now moved to the cloud as well with the uh, advent of Office 365 syndication as well as PBX solutions and email solutions that are in the cloud as well. So what does, this ma uh, what does this mean for VPSs then? Well, what's happening with VPSs is that we're moving away from 
uh, are, are expanding, I should say, not moving away, but expanding from our traditional ideas of what a hosted VPS is to what we're now calling cloud VPS. And this migration provides many advantages for both the small business, but also many opportunities for the hoster. Some of the key characteristics of these cloud services are elastic capacity, the movement from a static fixed set of resources that a customer, an end customer would select and receive a fixed monthly bill for, to a more scalable and dynamic uh, VPS that allows that VPS's uh, capacity, both memory and size, storage capacity, to dynamically expand as the uh, as required by applications running on that particular VPS. This is more efficient for both the customer as they're using only the resources they actually need. It's also more efficient for the hoster because now you can uh, maximize and effectively load balance your, uh, your infrastructure across a greater number of customers while providing them the capacity that they need on demand. This makes changes to your billing systems as well. Uh, previously, VPSs have been primarily delivered through a fixed monthly rate, and now we're moving with cloud to rate based on usage. Hourly usage rates are becoming more and more common, and those are based on the amount of resources actually used. Again, more efficient for the service uh, for the uh, SMB because they only pay for what they use, but it also gives them the capability to greatly scale. Uh, their applications when needed based on um, if, if it's a, uh, a retail application based on holiday uh, you know purchasing traffic for instance secondly uh, we're thirdly we're moving from really a, a single per VM type of provisioning to an overall self -serve, customer self-service provisioning model where the customers buying really what's a complete uh, virtual network for their solution set uh, and really uh, taking them to the place where they can instantly upgrade their services as desired. Also cloud storage or cloud VPS typically has some additional services like network storage which again uh, is typically provided as part of a cloud offering that offers uh, scalability and the ability to scale dramatically uh, based on usage as well as uh, additional complex services that bring the full virtual data center capabilities to the SMB, including support for load balancers, firewalls for additional security, uh, configurable backup solutions as well. So what this means for VPS is that we're moving from a very standardized model to a much more dynamic, scalable, and full service model for the SMB. So does this mean VPS is really dead? Well. It doesn't mean it's dead, but it means that it's moving ahead to a whole new place. And that whole new place means that for the hoster, uh, this means new business models need to be deployed, new capabilities need to be understood. There are many concerns about how we do this. What's going to happen to the dedicated server business uh, and the legacy VPS business? Is the cloud VPS going to consume everything? Uh, can I, how, how am I going to be able to offer these services? Uh, will my billing system still work? Will I be able to provision them? What type of infrastructure do I need to put in place to make that happen? Am I going to make more money or less money per customer? And are cloud offerings more complex to deploy and maintain? All of these are questions that uh, hosters are working through today as we're moving into this new era of cloud-hosted VPSs. So the answer is, is that you know, VPS isn't really dead. But VPS on its own is really going to be no longer enough for hosters to compete. Um, as we can see from this data, which we've taken from a, a Tier 1 research report, that uh, VPS growth, which at this point, of course, is the, is the majority of, of current hosted infrastructure uh, for VPSs, uh, is at about uh, $0.9 billion, uh, and that continues to grow going forward although that growth is moderate at roughly 15%. At the same time, the current size of the cloud infrastructure market is quite small and, in fact, very difficult to measure today exactly. But what we do know is that that cloud infrastructure market is going to experience dramatic growth, uh, 55 to 60% growth over the next four to five years 
and that that growth is going to come primarily from cannibalizing on-premise solutions as well as the dedicated server business. And we know that there are significant numbers of uh, on-premise servers which have not been converted to the cloud yet. And so when uh, businesses look to move those services to the cloud, they're going to look to cloud VPSs as the as the target versus uh, traditional VPS services, simply because cloud is going to be more efficient for them as a small business moving forward. And what we can see is that four or five years from now, uh, cloud VPS will become a significant percentage of the overall infrastructure as a service marketplace. And as part of that, our customer expectations are shifting for to what they need. So the answer here, I think, is that, that VPS isn't necessarily dead. It's still getting strong growth. 15% is, is a decent growth. But if you want to compete as a hosted service provider in the market going forward, you need to have a cloud strategy that's going to allow you to take advantage of where this significant growth is going to, uh, to come over the next several years. So how do we go about opening those cloud markets? Well, what we see is that there are uh, several steps or several capabilities that you can add that will allow you to maximize your revenue potential of this cloud infrastructure market going forward. These are, these are steps that you can take uh, immediately or you could add them as additional service components going forward. What we see on the left side is traditional VPS services really started initially as naked VPS. We've added self-service and automation to that along with choices of virtualization. So today we have many types of hypervisors as well as container market, uh, container capability, and many hosters offer uh, a significant number of options for their customers to select from those uh, different types of virtualization. But as we move forward to cloud infrastructure, we want to be able to start adding elastic VPS capability, which we've talked about. We also want to add uh, API so that developers can easily access that cloud, build applications, and deploy applications into that cloud, as well as uh, pull information in and out of that cloud. And then by m maximizing our, ref uh, our revenue potential by uh, allowing our customers to access complete virtual data centers in the cloud with the addition of cloud storage, full multi-instant, multi-tenancy, as well as load balancing capability. And all of this functionality connected through automation with a platform that allows fully automated uh, billing and provisioning so that you can deploy and scale these services uh, rapidly and easily for your customers. So what is it that SMBs expect from a cloud service? Well, we've broken this down to, to roughly 10 things we believe need to be part of any cloud service that's being deployed. Elastic scalability, the ability to grow or shrink those resources instantly with no reboot and uh, no need to uh, shut those VPSs on and off as we expand those capabilities. The ability to deploy very uh, intuitive and efficient user interfaces for the service provider. We'll touch on the end customer in a minute here. But for the service provider, the ability for them to easily uh, deploy predefined service packages, make it easier for them to upsell, uh, make them easier for them to resell those services throughout their channel through uh, very efficient user interfaces and predefined templates and packages. Um, access to API so that developers uh, can access uh, applications and develop them within that cloud as well as APIs for the service providers that allow them to obtain programmatic control over the provisioning and billing, as well as the ability to integrate uh, maybe their legacy billing systems into that cloud, ser uh, cloud service so that they uh, aren't, aren't required to uh, make, make significant changes to all of their infrastructure, as well as providing them with the ability to uh, customize and enhance the capabilities of the cloud platform. Multi-tenant efficiency, of course, is a key requirement that allows uh, service providers to house multiple customers on a single physical server. Um, of course, this capability is essential uh, to enable uh, maximum efficiency of, of physical infrastructure. Uh, choice of virtualization. We know that many customers today would like to be able to 
uh, choose what types of virtualization technologies they have available, uh, whether that's containers or hypervisors. Um, and also within that category of hypervisors, what hypervisor uh, would I like to use? Uh, some customers uh, would like to be able to provide branded hypervisors. Uh, some customers have specific requirements that require the use of specific uh, hypervisors. So having that choice is critical as well. And then for the end customer, allowing them to self-service uh, provision and administrate that. So a simple dashboard that allows customers to provision those cloud services and then dynamically grow or shrink or delete the resources they need based on uh, what they're projecting. So uh, the ability to allow your end customers to very easily uh, deploy and manage uh, the, the cloud services as well as add additional options like backup capabilities and firewall capabilities. Security and load balancing, we've, I've mentioned before, of course, critical to maximizing efficient use of your existing infrastructure. And security is one of the key issues that many SMBs are concerned about as they move to the cloud. So having a firewall protection around your cloud, uh, it will be an important option to offer customers. Uh, there should be uh, multiple storage options. They need to be fully scalable. They need to be shared or, or local storage. Uh, iSCSI is the uh, common interface used today for interfacing to network storage, and so we need to have that capability as well. And then uh, within that cloud, the ability to both uh, operate within the cloud through a secure VPN, VPN as well as the ability to uh, write, into, write, write and read from that cloud via a secure VPN uh, and operate really as a secure uh, network or VPN network uh, for your services will be critical. And lastly, um, providing those uh, service providers with a complete solution that allows them to manage the full stack of requirements, but at the same time make it modular so that um, if they don't want to use the billing system that comes with their cloud uh, infrastructure, they don't have to. They can use their existing billing system. If they want to add additional SaaS capability to their cloud offering, they can do that easily. So um, making a, a solution that fits in with the existing infrastructure that is deployed within the service provider will be critical as well. So overall, uh, what we've covered is that the cloud infrastructure for hosters needs to be a comprehensive solution. It needs to cover virtualization, which is really the basis of all uh, cloud infrastructure, but it also needs to support automated provisioning, automated billing, needs to provide storefront capabilities uh, for the service providers so that customers can easily order services as well as uh, provide those end customers then with the capability to self-service and manage their cloud. All of this needs to be delivered uh, in a system that's very easy to deploy out of the box, comes with templates, comes with uh, best practices designed into it, and also with a system that's fully modular so that you have APIs uh, to billing, but you can then also have full APIs to allow customization of the solution. And then there needs to be external facing APIs that support uh, the developer community that's uh, rapidly forming around uh, around the cloud. Virtualization is really the foundation of the cloud. Um, we believe the solutions need to be hyper, hypervisor agnostic. Uh, many customers want to manage their own operating systems, so uh, they will select hypervisors as their cloud option. However, uh, we believe that containers are a more efficient way uh, they do offer higher density and uh, near native server performance and so we believe that uh, the economics around containers are very compelling. We know that there are several or many large companies today that are basing a significant amount of their technology on containers to support their uh, external or internal clouds and uh, Google and Facebook are just two of the examples of some of the larger uh, container based uh, clouds that are out there today. And really, this all comes down to economics. So just a really simple uh, set of equations here. 
uh, if we look at the, the number of hypervisors versus containers that you can typically put on a server, we see containers at two to three times, uh, two and a half to three times higher density per server. And if we uh, make some assumptions about revenue per VPS, uh, we can see that the net margin that you can uh, drive off a server that's using containers uh, will typically be uh, several times higher than what you can drive off hypervisors. So uh, for us, we believe that uh, in the end, uh, it's important to be able to offer containers as an option for those uh, hosters who want to maximize efficiency and provide the most uh, beneficial economic model, but at the same time, uh, they also want to provide options to their end customers. So we believe that that will be the future for virtualization in the cloud. Um, just a simple example of what a storefront might look like for uh, a typical customer who wants to be able to build their own virtual environment. Needs to be very simple to upsell and modify and help reduce any kind of confusion. So uh, we believe you need to have a set of predefined packages. It makes it very easy for customers to select. But then at the same time, within the uh, context of those particular packages, have the ability to uh, dynamically adjust uh, the amount of memory, disk space, and so on. And while they're making those adjustments, uh, dynamically have that pricing estimate change per month as well. Okay. And then lastly, of course, providing them with additional options like operating system choices, backup uh, choices, advanced settings, or, which would uh, allow them to set up additional security settings and firewalls as well. So a uh, simple example of what a, uh, what a storefront might look like for a, uh, for a customer selecting uh, cloud. Also on the, uh, on, the, on the infrastructure side, we'd like to provide uh, the service provider with the ability to easily manage their virtual environment as well as provide um, the admin within that customer with a control panel that allows them to um, bring in or in, uh, manage their virtual environment, stop and start it, um, add new images to it as well, help them, uh, help them with a, a control panel that allows them to easily manage their services. So um, within this, we, we are deploying a very similar, uh, a familiar uh, cloud management type of uh, UI that's very familiar to our existing service providers. And then, of course, we need to provide the ability for those people who don't want to use UIs, the ability to have fun writing code against uh, APIs that help them describe, create, uh, turn on, power off, completely customize uh, their cloud services, and uh, manage applications that are running within those services. So um, need a powerful API interface that's uh, available for developers as well. So what are the key components then of, a, of a, the Parallels Automation Cloud Infrastructure? Well, you can see that we have at its very core uh, a set of virtualization options, the ability to run both containers and VMs uh, with individual OSs uh, simultaneously uh, against uh, storage, the ability to deploy a load balancer, and then connect all that to your billing, performance management, provisioning systems via Parallels Automation. We also uh, have to have the ability to connect to the internet through a firewall that uh, will enhance security or ensure security of that cloud and uh, provide a web front end for both your storefront as well as an ability to deliver control panels uh, to your end customers. So all of this forms the basis of our uh, core architecture and uh, platform for cloud infrastructure. But we believe that uh, this isn't uh, everything that a service provider needs in order to deploy cloud. It provides the very basis of a cloud solution, but you need to be able to deploy more than just a cloud. You need that cloud to form the basis of an entire ecosystem. So when you select Parallels Automation for cloud infrastructure, you are uh, 
purchasing a solution that's part of a completely enabled ecosystem through Parallels Automation. Parallels Automation allows you to quickly and rapidly set up reseller control panels for a whole variety of resellers which may range from VARs, SIs, vertical uh, hosters or smaller hosters who may want to deliver uh, cloud services combined with their own localized offerings directly to their services as well. They may also want to provide cloud services uh, to their customers but provide incremental uh, on-site services and configuration services to SMBs. So Parallels Automation enables uh, you to deliver uh, and easily resell that cloud infrastructure out to a whole set of uh, additional service providers who uh, can greatly expand your market presence. The second piece that Parallels Automation provides is the ability to extend that cloud solution with additional SaaS and syndicated offerings. And uh, as part of that, there are roughly, uh, today, roughly 300 different uh, applications for Parallels Automation that have been wrapped in our APS standard and are available for our uh, Parallels Automation service providers to uh, offer as service packages both directly to their customers as well as through uh, their resale channel. All of these applications have been wrapped uh, uh, around a, a open XML standard that we call APS, which is available through uh, APS.org. And as I said today, roughly 300 applications, including Office 365 and a whole host of PBX and other types of offerings are available, as well as a full range of SaaS offerings. So, in conclusion, is VPS dead? Uh, not really, but we do know that, and, and not at all, actually. I mean, VPS is going to continue to grow. Uh, at 15%, it's still a, a robust growth. But moving forward, we see that the cloud is going to prevent a provide a significant opportunity for hosted service providers. And um, for them to take advantage of this opportunity, we know it's important for uh, them to move ahead quickly and establish uh, the infrastructure and the capabilities they need to deploy. So uh, customers have a new expectation of VPS. It's the cloud. And uh, that cloud brings new challenges for service providers, but it also brings significant new opportunities, as, as we've just seen. Um, and so uh, with Parallels, we are uh, working together with our service providers uh, partners to provide and extend their existing infrastructure with a complete solution that allows them to deliver on these cloud VPS requirements. Okay. Um, I think we'll pause here and uh, see if we have any questions, Liam. Okay, and I, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd just like to remind everyone that uh, they can use the, the, the question function in the webinar software to submit questions to me, and I, I've got a handle of those right now. Um, while we wait for some audience questions to come in, I've got a, qu a couple of questions of my own that, that I've written down here. Now, I guess uh, the distinction that you seem to have set out to make was that uh, while the I don't want to say the appetite for, but the the uh, the desire to to use what we, what we'd called traditional VPS. In that slide, you had that broke down left and right between uh, you know the the traditional services that were sort of the naked VPS up all the way all the way up to on the right, you had the, the the more complicated services with the APIs and the you know the cloud storage and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a a use case just for those old VPS, the the sort of simple VPS service? Yeah, of course. There's, there's, there continues to be significant use cases for those, uh, you know, for the simple VPS services, and uh, there's no question that those will continue to exist and continue to grow. We've seen, uh, we believe that those are going to grow at roughly the 15% rate that I, that I, uh, that I described. Where we think the growth from cloud is going to come is primarily from displacing. Um, existing on-premise uh, servers as well as solutions that are currently locked into dedicated servers. So we certainly expect to see uh, continued growth in the, in the legacy server business uh, or in the legacy VPS or the fixed VPS business. Uh, 
and continued use of those applications. Many customers today, uh, you know, will feel that their applications, uh, you know, can operate very efficiently and uh, very low cost and uh, highly secure within a, in a fixed VPS environment. So I, I'm certain we'll continue to see those uh, being deployed significantly. Okay, we have a, a, an attendee question here, which I think is a pretty interesting question. Is, uh, I guess, do you see customers who don't have a need for the scalability of the cloud or, or for the elasticity of the cloud uh, and are fairly certain they will only need X number of resources, uh, do you see any chance of them moving to the cloud just because it's cooler or better or more interesting? Well, I think what we're going to see is a, what we're seeing, actually, to be specific, is we are seeing uh, through this reseller channel uh, many of the smaller hosters uh, seeing that, that they want to be able to offer cloud VPSs as a low-cost option to uh, their traditional VPS business, but they don't want to invest significant amounts of uh, dollars in the infrastructure required to host that cloud VPS. So uh, what we can do with Parallels Automation is very easily allow the smaller hoster uh, through a reseller agreement with a large hoster to offer uh, cloud VPSs as an option to their existing VPS services. So what we're seeing is that uh, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in what the level of uptake of the cloud is going to be. You can see the projections that are coming from analysts are, are very optimistic, but uh, you know, they are projections. And we see uh, also uh, small hosters with the minimum amount of capital uh, don't necessarily want to go through a significant uh, outlay of cost to, to purchase additional servers and so on that might be required to deploy cloud solutions. So um, one, of the, one of the ways that the smaller hoster can test the market is they can easily become a reseller of uh, those cloud services with a PA partner. And we have many of those who are, their sole business is to provide a reseller uh, channel to small hosters. So what we're seeing is that uh, many small hosters interested in uh, testing the market for, for cloud VPS uh, and what we're doing here with uh, Parallels Automation is providing them with a very low cost way to test that market within their particular uh, set of customers and their particular region. So I think, I think that the specific question was about, I mean, is the audience for uh, or does the audience for cloud VPS include people who are pretty satisfied with their current VPS solutions? I mean, from the perspective of a hosted customer who has VPS customers, um, can I expect that some of those customers, even if the VPS is meeting their need, would be interested in the cloud stuff? Um, yeah, of course. I mean, there will be some existing VPS customers who uh, might, for their particular application, see some economic efficiency in moving to a cloud. There also are certain clearly examples of current VPS customers who are very interested in the elastic scalability capabilities. So where the current applications that are running within fixed VPSs uh, certain, during certain surge, surge periods, uh, those VPSs are becoming overburdened. Um, we certainly have examples of uh, end customers who are struggling with that who would be interested in the cloud. Um, at the same time, uh, there are a tremendous number of, uh, you know, VPS, uh, traditional VPS customers who are perfectly happy uh, and feel like they're getting a very, uh, you know, very good, efficient cost out of their system that are probably going to, you know, stay with the simplicity of, the, of their existing VPS service. Okay. Um, so I guess, <laughs> I mean, I guess to a certain extent it's up to the hosting provider themselves to sort of distinguish between the two, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, I guess somebody was asking if you could um, sort of better clarify the difference between a virtual machine and a container and sort of what the performance differences might be. Okay, yeah. No, I didn't want to make a confusion between a virtual machine and a container. Um, a, a, uh, a container is a virtual machine. There are actually two types of ways that you can deliver a virtual machine. Uh, through a hypervisor virtualization technology, which virtualizes at the operating system. 
at the hardware level, I'm sorry, uh, hypervisor technology, which virtualizes at the hardware level. And uh, this has the, the benefit of allowing uh, the customer to deploy their own OS within that particular uh, virtualized machine. Um, the other type of virtualization technology, which also allows you to create a VM, is containers technology. Containers technology virtualizes on top of the operating system. So this has the advantage in that it allows for higher densities and higher performance from the VM. However, all of the containers on that particular server must use the same operating system. Um, for most customers, this isn't an issue, and they're most, mostly concerned about uh, high efficiency and high density, um, but with containers, you don't have a choice of operating system for your VM. Again, for hypervisors, um, it, hyper, it uh, virtualizes on top of the bare metal, uh, less efficient, less density on the server, but allows you to deploy your own OS within that particular virtual machine. Is that clear? Yeah, that makes sense to me. Okay, yeah, so both, both technologies, containers and hypervisors, allow you to deploy virtual machines. They're just two different virtualization technologies for doing so. Okay. Um, I had actually had a question where uh, I thought it was interesting that you had sort of uh, set out to offer so, so many variations. And, uh, I know you said you had the, this, you had sort of that sample uh, menu, I guess you could call it, where the, uh, the prospective customer could sort of customize their cloud VPS. Right. Um, right. Now, when you see variations on things like uh, operating system or things that go beyond just like the variations in disk space or things like that. I mean, do those kinds of variations apply to different markets in your experience, or is 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 there just a sort of a general opportunity? Um, I think uh, in general, uh, for most customers of VPS services, they are IT people. Uh, you know, whether they're uh, a single small business that is. Uh, you know, that just needs a single server, the person purchasing, purchasing that VPS is still a technical person. And they have an application in mind for that particular VPS. And so that person, you know, typically is going to want to specify, to optimize their cost, specify, you know, at least the amount of memory and the amount of disk space, the number of CPUs, the programming capabilities that they need to run their particular application on that VPS. So um, we certainly see, uh, you know, a, a range of potential offerings uh, from our service providers that are partner service providers, where they'll, they'll offer, um, in some cases, uh, very simple, you know, packaged offerings, um, and in other cases, they may have dozens and dozens of different uh, VPS offerings and configurations. So. Um, again, I think it really depends on the target customer, um, a small business who wants to run a simple application, you know, might have a very, a very basic configuration, a larger business that wants to outsource their entire IT, obviously is going to have multiple different uh, requirements and uh, multiple different configurations that they may want to optimize for. Okay. Somebody else has a, a, another a uh, pretty interesting question here where um, if you're if you are a traditional VPS host right now and you have had success in selling traditional VPS services to people um, and therefore you know selling them a little more than they might be buying otherwise with the with the scalable stuff or the custom size stuff uh, is there is there an advantage to you in, in, in trying to sell customers more efficient services and, 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 you know, selling less capacity to them? Or, I mean, do the, do the efficiencies, I guess, how do those efficiencies also benefit the host? And do they benefit the host enough to make it worth trying to make that shift in service? Yeah, well, part, there's, there's many, many parts to this answer. First of all, um, what's happening in the market is that a significant number of service providers are now moving to a lot uh, of, both, both traditional service providers as well as uh, new entrants to the market, Amazon probably being the primary example of that, are offering uh, 
uh, very cost competitive cloud VPS solutions. And so uh, step one is, uh, you know, we need to be able to offer to our existing customers um, competitive solutions against what's happening in the market. We need to be able to hold on to those customers and uh, provide them with options. So, uh, of course, it's better to retain that customer. Uh, if that customer needs to go to a cloud VPS for whatever reason, if it's, if it's better pricing or if it's more technical capabilities, um, certainly you want to retain that customer by having that option. So it's a competitive world. We can see that cloud VPSs are going to be uh, a significant uh, component of that world going forward. And so we need to be able to have that as an option for those particular customers. That said, we also want to be able to upsell those customers with additional services that we haven't been able to provide before. So before we were providing them with a fixed VPS. The core elastic VPS may or may not be less expensive. It depends on how you price it. But now we're adding additional services that you can provide that customer, like storage, uh, like firewall protection. Uh, and so uh, like, as I described, uh, potential additional SaaS offerings, um, many other capabilities that can now be uh, priced and packaged together with that cloud service. So um, yes, maybe the core uh, uh, Elastic VPS service might be less expensive for that particular customer, might generate less revenue, but at the same time, we're adding a, a whole uh, host of other additional services that you can package with that cloud VPS um, that will allow that customer to still to, to possibly uh, outsource even more of their IT so that uh, your share of their IT budget effectively increases. Um, while the customer is still getting a more efficient uh, spend for their IT dollars. Does that make sense? I think so, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm kind of curious about um, the migration path from a traditional VPS to the cloud VPS. Is that something that you sort of spelled out in, in, in detail, or is it complex? Is it simple? Um, I think it depends on what type of platform uh, that you choose to use. Certainly, uh, if you try to build this capability in-house, I think it's a lengthy and complex pr process. Um, but for customers who choose an automation platform that has these uh, systems already predefined and uh, can easily integrate into their in existing infrastructure, it can be a very rapid process. So we see a full range. We see uh, and a, and a mixture in between. We have uh, some uh, hosters who are uh, building their own core infrastructure, and that's a difficult multi-year project typically. We also have some hosters who want pieces of, uh, of, the, of, uh, of an automation solution, but they also want to have their own customized pieces, and so that's another way to go. And then there are some hosters who will simply uh, choose a out-of-the-box solution for automating their cloud infrastructure. And uh, we try to provide uh, options to customers that uh, span that whole spectrum. Okay. I guess my, my, I sort of phrased the question wrong there, but I guess my, um, I mean, that was also interesting. <laughs> my, uh, my question was dealt more specifically with, let's, let's assume that I'm a, uh, using, you know, Parallels Automation and I want to start using the Parallels uh, Cloud VPS uh, right. automation as well. And I have a customer who's on a traditional VPS and they want to move into the sort of cloud uh, VPS sort of format. Is, the, is that a difficult migration to make? No, no, not at all. If you have Parallels Automation as your current infrastructure platform, adding, uh, adding cloud, our cloud infrastructure solution to that existing platform is a very simple, uh, you know, two to three week uh, type of services engagement. Okay, so I, I have a question here about somebody who, um, I guess, asking uh, generally about the barrier to or the price barrier that might be presented by um, the, the the requirement of having network storage uh, attached mm -hmm. to your cloud. Uh, so, so in in order to yeah. provide the kind of performance from that storage that you might get with local storage, you need to have some yeah. fairly expensive network gear in, involved. Um, yeah, can you talk about that sort of that hurdle? Sure. I think there's uh, what we want to do is provide uh, 
options for the service provider around what types of storage offerings they provide for their cloud. So um, uh, we want to make that an option. So as a service provider with our cloud infrastructure solution, you can choose to host your own storage infrastructure, which, which may be, depending on you know, the price your customers pay, um, might, not, might be a feasible, might not be a feasible option for them. But we also have the ability for you to uh, network and uh, provide that, uh, you know, burst that storage out to other clouds as well. So uh, your customer, you may choose to offer your customers uh, cloud storage through through PACI um, from a different cloud, uh, a different cloud storage vendor uh, at whatever price they may offer. And then in the future, you may then decide to offer that storage yourself. So uh, the economics, I think, around cloud storage are still uh, very flexible. Um, we see some very low prices for cloud storage, but at the same time, I'm not sure that those providers are making money on that storage. So I think there might be some, uh, some, pro some providers that are uh, investing in the market to provide low-cost cloud storage. Uh, and that might not be the thing that you want to do today. So providing that as an option, allowing customers to access cloud VPS but to maintain their local storage, allowing you to then provide uh, cloud storage either uh, as a part of your infrastructure or as, uh, as a, a, a service you resell from an existing cloud storage provider. Uh, those are all the options that we need to be able to provide so that as these storage uh, models and prices change over the next several years, you can adjust your business model accordingly. Okay. Um, I, I have a, uh, I have a, sorry, sorry, I've run out of audience questions. I wanted to make sure that people know they can still keep submitting questions, but uh, I'm not sure if, uh, if you have any, I think maybe in the in, in the meantime, while we wait to see if anyone else wants to submit questions, I was thinking that you could perhaps discuss some of the specifics involved in, and this this might be just for the people who who are already uh, using Parallels Automation to sort of provide their services, but want to explore adding some of that cloud stuff. How do they go about that first the, the first step in sort of incorporating some of that cloud technology? Okay, well the first step of course is to uh, contact us here at Parallels. You can either contact me directly or we do have a uh, Parallels Cloud uh, infrastructure uh, page on our website and uh, there's a contact form there. So just uh, please reach out to us and we'll be happy to, uh, to contact you about what, uh, you know, what we need to do to help you uh, profit from the cloud and deploy uh, Parallels Automation for Cloud Infrastructure. Okay, I, we do we do have a user who uh, has alerted me to the fact. Okay, sorry, he was writing out the question. Um, mm -hmm. I got another question in the meantime. Um, uh, somebody says they're using PBAS for for their interest infrastructure. And, yeah. Uh, and do they have a timeline for when they'll be uh, making cloud services available <laughs> through that? <laughs> Great, good question. Uh, we love all our PBAS customers. And uh, we appreciate that. Um, we are currently uh, working on uh, significant extensions to PBAS, which will be announced, um, interestingly enough, at our Parallel Summit. And I'll throw the uh, I'll throw my own little uh, slide up here on February 14th through the 16th. Uh, I am sort of under embargo to not enable. Uh, uh, kind of pre-announcing uh, some of that information, but I can tell you that we are making uh, significant strides with PBAS to add uh, the full range, the capability for you to deploy the full range of services uh, that I've described uh, as part of our Parallels network. So uh, that's about all I can kind of hint at right now, but uh, I will assure our PBS customers that uh, in, uh, in 2012, 
uh, they will have the ability to greatly expand uh, the offerings they can deliver through PBAS. Okay, so somebody was asking about uh, in in in, this, in in building cloud storage in which uh, with, sorry with which to support this this cloud VPS stuff. There so there seem to be a lot of vendors um, offering you know tools for tying together servers or, or, or tying together other things to to build um, cloud storage solutions based on an assembly of things, but not too many people who sell the iSCSI -E storage or block level storage, and whether you had any mm -hmm. recommendations of people who you think might be doing a good job of that. Yeah, so as part of our, um, I will sort of pre-announce that as part of our uh, deployment of uh, PACI, we are partnering with uh, and doing work with several uh, com companies that allow cloud storage uh, solutions today. And the first one of those that we're going to be announcing here in a couple weeks is with a company called Scality. And Scality provides a, a ring storage capability, a very scalable, uh, very responsive storage that uh, can be packaged as part of a, uh, an APS package and uh, is already pre-integrated with Parallels Cloud, uh, cloud Infrastructure. So uh, we have a, an initial partner that we're working with for uh, providing really a best of breed out of the box cloud storage solution uh, that's already been deployed in, in a significant number of uh, cloud environments. So um, I would point to Scality as, uh, you know, as one of our uh, preferred technologies for cloud storage coming out of the gate. Okay. I don't seem to have any other uh, audience questions. I know we're about eight minutes shy of uh, the full hour, but uh, I would be content uh, to end a few minutes early if, if that's all right with you. That sounds great. I appreciate uh, everyone's time today. I do want to mention that uh, a couple things that are coming up. Our Parallel Summit in Asia Pacific region is going to be on September 22nd through the 25th. And uh, we will be announcing uh, uh, some of our PACI existing customers, as well as uh, I kind of previewed our, our partnership with Scality uh, will also be announced there. And then uh, we will be doing our annual uh, Parallel Summit on February 14th through the 16th. And uh, you can see all the details in the agenda for that at Parallels.com slash summit slash 2012. I appreciate everyone's time today, and uh, thank you very much, Liam. Okay, well, uh, before we before we turn things off here, I just wanted to also uh, thank everyone for attending. Thank everyone who submitted questions; they were they were quite good. Uh, of course, I want to thank Lowell for providing us with some excellent insight into the subject that uh, I think is pretty uh, pretty interesting to everyone, and and fairly significant to everyone who's operating this business right now. Uh, finally, I would just like to remind everyone that a, an archived copy of this webinar will be online at thewordcom slash webinars early next week, uh, along with archived copies of a lot of other great webinar content that we've done. So um, thanks, everyone, and uh, have a great day. Oh, and uh, sorry, we could add that if you have any other questions, you can uh, you can check out Twitter, or you can direct them to, to uh, Parallels at Twitter at, uh, at Parallels Cloud. So thanks, everyone, and have a great day.